so interesting because I feel like it crystallizes at different moments. <laughs> this um, sort of deepening in and then also like the directionality, like how we connect to this idea of source and then also venture out to welcome it or manifest it. And for me, it's, it always goes back to the liberation of my, just my body. Like, I think it's so, it's from being so young and feeling like there were ways I wanted to express myself and the world disagreed with those ways of expression, you know, that like, and that the world disagreed to protect me. Like I see and hear memories of people saying, don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. You're never gonna be able to do so-and-so or da-da-da. You've got it, like get it together, get it in check. And I spent all this time trying to rein it all in <laughs> and um you know because you you trust the people ahead of you and you don't quite realize that they've also kind of ingested the myths and so I think for me like Every time I'm more fully in my body or I invite any other person to be a little more fully in their body, something like really magical happens. That is not, it is about me and it's also not about me at all. And it's this just ongoing guiding question of how we include the fullness of ourselves and how that I, I sense for myself, the more I offer myself that presence, the more I can extend it out to others. But there's this like, the image that I have Artemis, which I'd love to hear your thoughts on is like a kaleidoscope. Like in my mind, there are these little pieces of colored material um, that like open and close in each of us. And somehow it's that, you know, when we say inner and outer all the time, but I think I never quite before practices like SBT, I didn't quite understand how delicate it was to like really like have your, your inner kaleidoscope <laughs> fall into place and then dissolve and then, you know, repeat and how much like that you know, can be authentic without being a projection, you know, like you can, there are spaces that we can cultivate where like I can have my kaleidoscope and you can have your kaleidoscope and <laughs> they dance together. Or I guess this is my, I've, I've experienced this and this is what I, really wish for the world. It's my, that's my dream, I think. So interesting. You know, when I first did 20 Minute Dance, I was at the Interdependence Project in New York City on the Bowery and this like, they used to have this whole little space and it was Kate Johnson was leading it as part of a, uh, it was like a weekend retreat on other things. And I just had really never, I had really never felt my body like that. And it was, I'd been making art with my body for so long, you know, relatively speaking. 
Um, so it was just radical, actually. And it was radical to that allowance was radical. And also, I, I'm not sure what it's like and across our, like what the patterns are across our different disciplines, but in the theater, you know, some spaces that you're in, it's like, leave it at the door. Like, this isn't about you. This is about like, you arrive in your container or whomever is like directing the space. And the directionality is about you kind of offering your body instrumentally to something. And so of course I had been in a lot of those spaces. And then, some part of me was always just really curious about collaboration and other people. So I also really wandered into a lot of co-creative spaces where you are, you know, intentionally working with other people and making something that doesn't look like any one artist, but looks like this like tapestry. But I, I had never just practiced that so simply, I guess, before, you know, just for me, not for a class, not because I'm doing the practice in order to be a better ensemble member because we're making this goal-oriented thing, but just totally for me. And, and then to be, you know, a part of our cohort and to share it with other people over that year long program was just like really, really helped deepen it in me. Like how, how my individual practice could, could support the ways I am in groups. And it helped me really celebrate that the theater has just so much wisdom about that, that we don't really, slow down and talk about, or I think sometimes even think to share with other communities. It's like a thing that happens in that room of the rehearsal space. And so it just helped me to see how um, yeah, how deeply it could shape just our daily, my daily life more. Well, I was really grateful that our little group of five, that we, we brought forward daily life, like that we started these questions around our, our process. And so I, I sense it, it really kind of seeded there for me, that, that space. I don't know how much I, how clearly I saw it, but I think it was like arriving already. And then be because of that, I think it was just in the seed of the prototype that you all helped me initiate. And I do think it's a very interesting thing that's come up recently. You know, in our, our practice group on campus, we practice a lot, but we also, our reflection is often lo longer than like SPT reflection, if you're like at a, a basics, let's say. And I, I sense it's because as theater people, we, that's also a kind of common thing, like talking through what a moment is for us. So, so somehow we started talking about daily life that very first day in April when I shared some practices and I listened back to the recordings recently and the questions we're still exploring as a community, they were surfaced like that day about like identity and power and privilege and like safety in the village <laughs> came up like immediately after it, like students were wondering about this and you know, the sort of potency of the work as it connects to artistry, you know, creativity and like the, the way that it made something accessible for them that they hadn't, you know, they'd, they'd heard about 
theoretically, but they didn't feel like they had actually embodied it before. That came up instantly. And so did this project about the empathy to action, like the realization that that's what this leadership program had attempted to teach them about empathy and then leadership. <laughs> so like this idea of compassion, like all of those seeds just came right up. Um, so I think there was something in that, like the witnessing. And then we, the other thing we did that I now realize was a great discovery for someone else seating would be, we got together two weeks later and we didn't really, I didn't prepare anything. We just did what we had done in April, which was like gather with snacks and food and fellowship. And we needed to be in a conference room. We couldn't even really practice um, as much just because of space limitations, but we just shared what we'd been noticing. And there were a lot of beautiful shares that people explicitly stated, but I learned over the years that they actually started making really tangible, like they being the students and alumni that were there, made a visible shifts to their daily life in that two week period. That there was a way of somehow, you know, it created that kind of retreat. Um, what do you call it? <laughs> that, like, how you like go out into the world and you're tender all over. Um, you know, they always warn you at the end of the retreat, like, watch out when you're driving. Vulnerability, I don't know. <laughs> sure, yeah. Like something, like they just felt, they said they described it as feeling everything so sensitively. And, um, and so somehow it helped them decide, like, in a really discerning way, like, oh, that, that space I had been in, that relationship I had been in, I think I need to pause right now. And so they, they let go of behavior and um, activity and that just almost held, a lot of them held their own kind of like social ma. Um, and then sort of started weaving new things in or picking some things back up. Which is very interesting to me about just the the potency of the work, just the, and the chance to just be together, you know, just how, how radical it is to just sh share space, I think. I don't know about this word. <laughs> I mean, I think the most successful actions have come when it's really coming from the group. And I would say I'm offering like, the word allyship's been coming up a lot. Like there's some kind of allyship that gets offered to, you know, to hear those insights that they were having. And then, you know, from that, we decided to create this like theatrical project because that was what like really, they were so excited about it. And I don't know if you remember, but I was like, huh. <laughs> Like, like I wasn't planning to, I didn't come thinking we would end up wanting to make a play, but that's what they wanted to do first. And so I was like, oh, this is, this is where this fits for them. And, um, let's do it. And so from that sort of new space, it's like, it, it became a, another space, then other things would emerge that would make other spaces. And so I think, you know, the, if I think about like leadership as action, my actions were then, 
you know, about identifying bridges and partners and doors and sometimes getting those doors opened and sometimes not um, and having to find ways around. And I was thinking recently that there's something also about just sort of standing at those thresholds when people like their response back is no, or I don't get it, or um, this isn't relevant to, I've learned that one of my actions in that moment is, appears a little bit as doing nothing, but I, I kind of stick around. Like I, um, I joined different spaces that weren't looking for the work. <laughs> part of it's persistence, part of it's, I guess, a stubbornness that I hope has a not harsh edge, a kind of, it's really easy to be committed to trying when you see it living in the students and this alumni group. Like it just, the aloneness I would feel and, and conversations that are still, that I still feel very alone and disconnected on campus about the work often, um, it's totally replenished by practicing with them. And then, you know, then it's these other sort of concentric circles of like talking to you and, and realizing that like you see something in it is like totally regenerative and somehow um, gives you like, okay, <laughs> slow and steady, <laughs> you know? Kate has that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So it's something about this. For us, it's, it's deeply important, the, the and, like individual and, and, as well as the individual having lots of ands inside of themselves. And I've been learning a lot about this as it relates to the art making, the the relationship to creating narrative, creating story, responding to other art, like, and I, I, I feel like when I initially attempted to sort of articulate what the group's impulse was to create, when I tried to explain that to other people, yeah. I feel like there was confusion as if it was in the level of downloading or story or kind of like the drama triangles. And I'm sure that we, like everyone, are moving through all of that. And there's something about the space together, like the actual, witnessing space we are creating for each other that I sense is letting us um, connect more to that idea very aspirationally of, of what Peter Senge talks about, about the deeply personal revealing the deeply systemic. And it's still like very emergent, like what, why is that happening for us, you know? Um, especially in terms of like advising someone like how to do it. Like, I don't really know quite how to articulate that as a kind of, I guess, template. But I do think it has something to do with just the, that, the flow to the life, the flow to the needs. Like it has something to do with that. And it has 
something to do with that piece. Um, so like those ideas are from that talk that Nikki gave has something to do with the morning piece. I feel like the allyship, right? That the true allyship that I feel with you is also a space I feel with them. Like we are vulnerable with each other and to have like that too, I feel like goes back to that, that wish that I have from being a little girl of that being part of being human. And th that it's, that it does have something regenerative in it rather than something to fight or exclude, but that it actually makes more room. So I think there's something about the incredible, I mean, the group is so complex and diverse um, because each person <laughs> is really kind of reflecting on that. And there's also just something that inherently grounds us because of Queens, New York. <laughs> like it just, it isn't like, we can't take any credit for it. It's who, it's who's there. <laughs> like it's a wonderful recommendation of, of what to do when you're trying to figure out how to create a group of people, like try to create places like as magical as Queens, New York <laughs> in terms of diversity and um, perspectives. But, you know, we, it just was, we were already all together in the room sharing and our distinctions and also offering so many distinctions to each other. So that, that created something. I think that's very healthy and about an ecosystem. You know, it's about a, a living system. Our students, um, ongoing um, actions that are harmful and punitive and harsh and horrific um, all the time. <laughs> like as a white ally, I hear a lot and I'm sure I only hear the surface. It's just ongoing. So like the morning is also just being able to cry with other people in the community about the reality of that storm while um, friend recently, um, yeah, he shared this image of the storm and it helped me so much because I think sometimes we, we want to not say it over and over again. It's exhausting to say it over and over again. Um, and we don't, that's not what we want to make in the world. <laughs> we don't want to make the storm. So we don't want to repeat the storm. Um, but we, there's some part that we have to bear witness to the storm together. And I feel that the storm is such a great metaphor for me right now because it includes the sky right so it includes like the way we talk about meditation practice and the different weather patterns but it acknowledges just like how ferocious the weather can be sometimes and how you genuinely like have to take cover like you can't just always keep bearing your heart you have to sometimes like collapse and collapse with other people um because it's, yeah, it's not a light switch. Like it's not, it's not turning off the violence and the supremacy and the patriarchy. It's not going away. It's stronger than ever. And it feels more organized to me. It feels so much more organized. In different ways, like these, these partnerships and different positions, like different people on campus some staff members, some faculty, some students, some alumni, also people that aren't on the campus that are sort of part of this larger community of ours where we come together and can be authentic with each other, I think. I think there's this way that the circles just ripple and ripple. I think it's so important. You know, it's like, what a tremendous thing that you right now think that this this project is worth thinking about is like a tremendous gift to me and to the group to just stop and reflect upon it and be like wow yeah I guess I guess we're learning something that's worth sharing that's so lovely you know it's so lovely to remember that and then 
it, it does, it clears something, I think. So like I'm always amazed when I'm teaching general education classes and like public speaking or acting for non-majors, like how so often everyone's convinced they're the least prepared. Like, like no, no, I'm, I'm the least prepared. I am the one that doesn't know how. And yet we all know how to be. Like, and there's this perception that, that we don't and that I feel like so much of learning is remembering that we know how to learn and that we are like capable of, of taking in and, and also offering this like, the students have been using actor vocabulary with duet, radiate, and receive is what we say. So like this exchange and how it shows up, like at, it seems it shows up every single time, like supporting a student recently who was facilitating for the first time. And so the group makes space for this. Like we hear like someone has this aspiration. So like, okay, the group is gonna support this person who's going to facilitate. So people that have been facilitating step back we come, we show up, we like do little sessions just like we did in our training to support each other with this. And this artist in the group is so capable and was so confident that they were not. Like it was so terrifying. And just to bear witness to that reality that like there's something about the way we perceive our edges as being so fixed and it's like the group somehow we show up for each other we, we attempt to show up for each other like at that space where where the person is like convinced they can't like I want to but I can't I'm not good enough or capable and we just like hold the room for that and it just seems so necessary and I I feel like that's also what happens for me so often is I'm like I can sense there's there's this there's this other potential. It's out it's out there on the edges of my awareness, and then it's about sort of finding that like you were saying that support to kind of be at that edge with me and figure out, you know, well, well, why is it that I was drawn to it in the first place? Like if I think about this artist, like why why was it that they they wanted to facilitate? And, and like reconnecting with that to like step over that threshold that there's this perception of, of that erasure and rejection and just failing that's so heightened that the witnessing just helps us realize we're, we're going together. And it's like such a contribution, right? Like, like we were all like over the moon when they facilitated, like the whole group was like fireworks, you know, like alive and part of, of it happening. And then, um, this artist, they said, they shared in the context because it was at the CUNY diversity conference that they were facilitating for the first time. And they said, like after that had been their first facilitation. And that was also this like this beautiful thing to like let the audience know, like, thank you because you came. Um, this, this, this new thing that wanted to be born was like possible. And it took, you know, the sitters as much as it took the standers to make it. And so it just felt, I don't know, I think there's just so many ways I, I sense that we were so busy trying to go by ourselves that we, we don't realize how, how often the, the group really would love to go together and would love to be um, part of that. 
you know, it was, it was like an extraordinary thing. I mean, I imagine it has to do with where, where my body is at the moment. Like, am I receptive or am I in trauma locked down somehow? I think that if I or anyone has been able to take care of themselves, I think we open quite naturally. That's my experience. But I, the pandemic has taught me a lot about holding suffering. You know, how um, it was so bad in March and April. And class was just a way to remind ourselves we were living. And I would have never like, I would have told you I couldn't do it. Because I didn't, um, yeah, I think uh, I just never would have, you, nobody does, you don't. Um, you don't plan to be the person that students are calling when they're putting their parents in the emergency room and waiting for weeks. You don't plan to be like that. You don't realize you'll be that many people's call. Because like so much suffering is happening. People are just looking for someone so I think it, you know, it's so imperfect. You just try to stay with it enough so other people can stay with themselves too. You try not to pass it on, like the harm that you're experiencing. You try not It's very hard. I mean, it's like, I, the students and I now talk about it sometimes just in my general classes, like just the amount of work we all need to do to just let go of the trauma that you feel in your body. And yet we're coming to these classes to explore the body is like both for ourselves and also for this idea of self-expression as an artist and the limits to that, like until the body is, is able to be um, more healthy, you know, until we all can kind of let go of the echoes of the sirens and the just constant waves, right? Until, oh, until there's more space externally and internally, it just, has limits. You know, I think one of the gifts of my trauma is that I run towards I run I run right into the fire. And I've had to learn to like catch my breath and try to see like what do you want to bring when you're running that way? <laughs> or like, are you sure you jumping in at this moment is helpful? But that, you know, it's like the gift of being in a diverse community. It's it, the epigenetics of my genes. I always have.
there are these trees outside my window. And there's also, of course, like a telephone pole and like the, where this apartment is, it's the street with the bus even. So it's like, there's, to give you a full picture, <laughs> it, has, it has the urban and the nature. But it's been like delightful because there are these, all these cherry trees and blossoms all around the city. It's like there was this amazing exchange that happened with Japan in the past in Philadelphia. And it's just shocking to me how they're everywhere. <laughs> and um, I've never been able to actually watch a season where they like do their beautiful impermanence of being around so briefly. And then it'll like rain and <laughs> they look like they go from being like picture perfect to like melting and um and so I've started to love the melting so much and then so I've gotten kind of obsessed with the trees that people aren't you know Instagramming <laughs> and um and then it's been really cool to realize like they take turns you know like they really take turns like there's just this season where these different blossoms are like, okay, I'm up. <laughs> and they like have their like moment. Um, yeah, it's teaching me a lot.